Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Friday night study on the three angels' messages of righteousness by faith. And before we begin this study, uh, can we open it with a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the Sabbath and the blessings that we have in fellowship and the blessings that we have in the truths that you have revealed to us, to the light that you have given to us in this dark, sinful world. And we know, Lord, that there is much in your word that we have not understood, that we have neglected because of our sins. But we ask, Lord, that you can enter into our hearts and into our minds as we read and study. We know, Lord, that what we're studying is a sad topic, what happened to E.J. Wagner. And um, we know, Lord, that we need to to trust in you, even in times of disappointment and temptation. Um, help us, we ask for forgiveness for our sins, that we can truly understand your word. Help us not, not to trust upon our past experience, but to have an experience that's new every morning. And we thank you for the blessing of the Sabbath and the fellowship that we can have with one another and with you. So we invite your spirit's presence into our hearts, into this study. And for all those who watch these studies online, we pray for them. For those that are searching for truth, we just pray that um, that your truth can be revealed to them through the spirit. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good evening. Happy Sabbath. The study that we're... Um, doing here is on E.J. Wagner's Confession of Faith that he wrote. Uh, it was found on his desk, desk um, when he died. So in 1916, was it? It says at the beginning of this paper, the date when he, when he passed away. And um, sadly, E.J. Wagner left, not just left the Adventist church, but he left the truth uh, that Adventists believe, and especially in regarding the foundation and central pillar of Adventism, that is the 2300 days in connection with the sanctuary. And he, he said some some things here, you know, where he talks about he's indoctrinated with this, and he's explaining why he doesn't think it's important. So um, we already read back here a bit where he's going to talk about uh, the 2300 days, you know, what took place in 1844. And he says, well, nothing, you know. And when I think about these types of things, so, you know, we're studying about what's happened to someone else. But these types of things happen to lots of people. And and none of us are immune to discouragement, uh, to rejecting light, just because we've rejoiced in light for a long time. It doesn't mean that we will always rejoice in that light. Things can happen. A challenge or a trial can happen. And, and we may not be willing to follow Christ any further. So when we look at, at other people who have fallen, often what people will do is they'll say, well, you know, I wouldn't have fallen, you know. It, it, and we sort of look down on people who have left the truth. And, and I've seen people who've looked down on other people who've left the truth. And then they leave the truth because they don't realize the dangers. And so we can't exalt. Um, you know, a really bad example of this was when um, Parminder's group left back in 2019. And many, many people in this movement were sort of, I call it schoolyard talk. It's this sort of thing, you know, where you just talk about the other person as if, you know, you're somehow better than them. You know, it's like when you have a fight or something in the schoolyard and, you know, the other people, the other group, and you talk, you know, you just talk big about, you know, how one, how wonderful you could have beat them up or whatever. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's not a Christian way to look at things. When people have left the truth, it's not something that we should c congratulate ourselves about that we haven't. We need to recognize that we need to pray for people. 
We're, we're no better than anyone else. And, and there's a real danger when we just think about when we think we're just better than them, you know, they, they departed from the truth. And, and we've had it in our movement recently, you know, many of the things that we've come to understand is truth that have supported our understanding of Adventism are slowly being eroded because of disappointments and discouragements that have happened, mistakes that people have made. It's just sad to see, but we have to be careful. And, and so in examining what Wagner is saying, I mean, we're, we're showing where he's wrong, but it's not, it's not so much the doctrines. It's not like, because the real reason why he left the truth is not an intellectual reason. I mean, he says it is, right? He's using an intellectual excuse. But we can see behind it how people think when they leave the truth, that there is a way in which a person's mind, um, because I had a really good friend, my best friend, uh, you know, he left Adventism. He became an Adventist in 1998 because of my influence. Well, we, we started hanging out in 1998. And um, he left Adventism in 2009, I think, around then, maybe 2010. Anyway, at, at one point, he stopped believing in God. And I'm not sure how long he could maintain that for. But, you know, when he told me, yeah, I don't believe in God anymore. You know, I wanted to hear what his really good reason for not believing in God was. And he didn't have a really good reason. He said, well, you know, the way the church has treated you and, and, and everything. And, you know, I just came to realize, you know, I can't prove God exists and things like that. But really, it was just an emotional. I mean, I knew him really well. He was my best friend for 15 years. You know, so 2013, I think, was last time when I got married. That's when I we, we stopped being friends just because lots of different things were going on in his life. So, um but we were best friends for 15 years. And so, you know, I knew his stories didn't really make any sense. You know, you know, I could see that he wasn't being honest about what was going on. And it was really just a personal discouragement on his part. So, you know, I still pray for him. Um, I don't know what he's doing now. It's been quite a while. It's like 11 years. So, but the point is people fall away from the truth and we can too. And we have to understand why, what's going on in our heart that's hindering our Christian walk. So we're going to look at this. We're going to start reading this. So he's yeah, dealt with uh, 300 days. And now he's going to deal with the investigative judgment. Yeah, Jeff? Yeah, and try to understand what would, what could cause us to, to go away from it, you know? Yeah. So, you know, we're being analytical, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. You know, we're trying to analyze and, and sort of put ourselves in that situation. How we, you know, what is our motives and what, what is his motives? Not to condemn him, but just do we see these things in ourselves? So, so now he's going to address the investigative judgment. So he dealt with the 2300 days, some of his reasons why, um, you know, uh, you know, he's going to deal with uh, Antiochus Epiphanes and things like that. You know, that's and, and we saw that, you know, uh, when I first became an Adventist, um, uh, my sister in law, she started going to these Bible studies it was called the Church of Christ and, and the Church of Christ. They 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 sort of set her up. They would have these Bible studies which were designed to get her out of Adventism and join their cult because they are a cult. Uh, so they had this. This guy, and, and, and they invited me to the Bible study, or she did. So he came to my house one time to try to convince me about this doctrine of the sanctuary, why it was erroneous. And, you know, the idea that the, the heavenly sanctuary, you know, doesn't need to be cleansed. Well, I was a brand new Adventist. I didn't even know anything really about the sanctuary message. So it's actually the first time I really studied it in depth. But what I found is, you know, the idea that the sanctuary, uh, needs to be cleansed. And we looked at this last time. Almost all things by the law in verse Hebrews 9, verse 22, are, are by the law purged with blood and without the shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens 
should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So one of the things we know is that the heavenly sanctuary needs to be purified or cleansed with the blood of Christ. Now, we obviously don't take this literally. Jesus did not carry his blood into heaven. And anybody knows that. I mean, maybe a little child might not understand the metaphor or the symbolism. Uh, but we don't believe that Jesus actually has his blood in heaven is, and is sprinkling it in heaven in a literal sense. Right. That's, you know, we, we understand it as a symbol, but we can still talk about it as a symbol. Right. Christ is, is ministering in the in the the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, and, and, and he was ministering in the holy place before that. So it's it's pretty simple. No, I don't think any of us believe that, you know, literally he's sprinkling blood in heaven, right? No, it represents his life, given his life. Yeah, so we understand it as a representation. Anyway, so Wagner's going to address this point, and, and uh, he says, but what about the investigative judgment? Yes, indeed, what about it? In truth, there's no responsibility resting on me to say anything about it, because in the entire Bible from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21 inclusive, there's never once any mention of such a thing. And of course, that's not true. Now, does the term investigative judgment show up in the Bible? No. But that does not mean that it's not there. Uh, I mean, we can think about, and, and, and he's, he's putting this in a very sort of framing it in a way, uh, that's not really what we understand to begin with, right? So anyway, we'll read on here and we'll address some of these points. A long time ago, I found the only way to avoid misunderstandings in Bible discussions was to keep clear of theological terms not found in scripture and hence not susceptible of Bible explanation. Well, you know, definitely the term cleansing of the sanctuary, uh, the ministry of Christ, all of these things are in the Bible. So the fact that we use some terms that aren't found in the Bible, you know, in, in the way that it was translated in the King James, it doesn't mean that those things don't exist. I mean, I mean, I know there's there's this one guy I had a discussion with recently. And he says you shouldn't call yourself a Seventh Day Adventist because that that's not in the Bible. And then he he says I belong I say that I'm I belong to the way because there's a Bible verse where it talks about uh, it uses the word the way and I think at one translation you know uses it like a title but it's actually a misreading of of the verse but anyway you know and and, and I would say well you know why what's wrong with the word Christian that's in the Bible but you know he likes to be called that I'm a follower of the way but the thing is. The term Seventh-day Adventist isn't in the Bible, but it does describe our basic doctrines. And it, it, to me, it's just a, a very, it's it's a poor system or way of thinking. So to say, I'm not going to use any theological term unless it's found in scripture. I don't think that that's a logical position to have, right? It's just, it's, there's all kinds of things that words that we use that we need to describe things, ideas that may not exist in the script in the scripture. But and a lot of times when we're studying the Bible, we we have to sort of put it into a language and, and frame it in a way that people can understand it. And that's lots of times we're going to use words that aren't found in the Bible. The Bible doesn't have that many words in it. Right. So, I mean, he's using all kinds of words here that aren't in the Bible, like the word susceptible. Ex explanation. I'm not sure if that's in there. Theological is not in the Bible, but he's using a, a theological term. The word theological is a term not found in the Bible. So he's not even following what he's saying that he's he's doing. He says, a brief consideration of the judgment in general will show that there is no place for an investigative judgment before the coming of Christ. You'll pardon me for quoting several passages of scripture in full instead of merely giving the references. I want the truth that they contain to stand out so boldly that it will be apparent what a libel upon God it is to assume that he is under the necessity of investigating the records of men's lives and characters in order to ascertain whether or not he can take them to heaven. And of course, we know that's not what the investigative judgment is. It, 
It is not God um, investigating the record of men's lives and characters so that he can ascertain whether or not he can take them to heaven. I mean, that's just completely ridiculous. No Adventist believes that. Maybe some do, but I don't know of any that do. So we know that God already knows our hearts. Long before we're even born, he knows our destiny. So obviously the investigative judgment is not for God, right? It's not, it's not for his benefit. So he's going to quote some verses that doesn't have anything really to do with the investigative judgment. It has to do with the idea that God already knows our hearts. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world, which we all agree with. Can any hide himself in secret that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? The word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there's no creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and laid open to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou searchest out my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, um, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. The foundation of God stand sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. Jesus did not commit himself unto them, because he knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. Okay, so we would agree with this. Now, he's saying that the investigative judgment uh, is God trying to determine or ascertain, you know, who should be in heaven and who shouldn't. So what is the investigative judgment? What's our understanding of it? Where would we find it in the Bible? And what, what is the importance of this judgment? Yeah, Anybody? You see the 10th day, 7th month, you see that. Okay, well, that's going to be the, the Day of Atonement. So um, so on the Day oh, of Atonement, yeah, right, so on the day of atonement yeah, God's up. going to begin a work. Now, that is the message that the Millerites gave is the hour of judge, God's judgment is come. So God's going to begin a work of judgment. You know, we call it the investigative judgment. So so what's happening? So when when God begins, when Jesus begins the investigative judgment, um, <laughs> What he's doing something, we represent him in heaven as sprinkling blood and, you know, cleansing the sanctuary, all these types of things. You know, thy will be done on earth as it is, is in heaven. So what he's doing in heaven is representing something that he's doing on earth. Now, we know, though, that he begins with the righteous dead. So what is that about? Why? Why? You know, how can people who are dead, how can. Jesus be ministering for them in heaven. What is he doing? You know, October 22nd, 1844, he goes into heaven, begins the work of investigation. So preparing a place for them, preparing it. Okay, so so we, we know, for instance, Abel. Is Abel going to be in heaven? More than likely, yeah. Well, well the Bible says he is, right? So we know yeah. Abel's going to be in heaven. Now, he's the first person that dies. Right. Yeah. As far as we know, he's definitely the first person murdered. Yeah. OK. So do we do we have to, you know, does, if since we already know that Abel's in heaven uh, or going to be in heaven and he and he might be in heaven, he might be one of those that were resurrected when Jesus was resurrected. Right. Um, so so if if we know Abel's going to be in heaven. Obviously, the investigative judgment, the purpose of it is not to figure out whether he's going to be in heaven or not. Right? Right. Okay. So, so what is the investigative judgment for? Why, why do we call it the investigative judgment? Why, why did Adventists pick up that term? Anybody know? Nobody knows? For Seventh-day Adventists, we should, we should 
know this. Okay, so we know there's an ex- executive judgment, right? Is, is that a biblical term? Yeah. Yeah. God shall execute judgment. Okay, so so there is a an executive judgment. When's the exec- executive judgment? Would that be in the holy place? No. Mm-hmm. It's, no. So the executive judgment, he's going to execute judgment. Just think of the word execute. Okay. Well, that's going to be that's going to be uh, after the thousand years, ain't it? Yeah, yeah. that's going to be after when when he assembles all the wicked in the world, and that's when he's going to execute the judgment, right? Yeah, and he's going to execute people, right? So, right. so it's called the executive judgment. Right. Now, so what we would have to do to understand the investigative judgment is to understand the whole work of the sanctuary. So we know that the work of the sanctuary is typical of a work that God is doing upon the earth. So we know the blood of goats and calves can't take away sin. But, you know, people would offer a lamb, right, or a goat or a bullock, and and that blood would be sprinkled, you know, either poured out at the base of the altar, depending on the offering and who's making it. Some would be sprinkled in the sanctuary. And the sanctuary would be defiled from that blood. And that blood would have sins transferred from it. Now, obviously, sins can't literally be transferred, you know, from a person putting his head on on, on a goat or a sheep or a lamb or a bullock. Those sins can't literally be transferred, but they can be transferred symbolically. So you you take this innocent victim, you confess your sins over it, you kill the victim, the priest catches the blood, he pours it out at the base of the altar if it's for an individual. Um, right? Now, these offerings, one thing we need to know is that in the earthly sanctuary, is there any offering you can do for murder or adultery or known sin? So if you committed murder, can you just op- do an offering? No, I don't think no, that's so. Just not, it. not an offering, no. No, there's no there's no offering in the earthly sanctuary for known sin. There's there's offerings for unknown sins, sins of ignorance, right? So if you commit a bit sin of ignorance. So one of the things about the earthly sanctuary is there actually is no forgiveness for known and deliberate sin. Right? So if if you transgress the Ten Commandments, there isn't an offering you could give. Remember when King David um committed adultery and murder? Right. Um, you know, adultery with Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, and, you know, put Uriah in the battle so that he would die. Um, yeah, but, he, but he would, but yeah, I see what, okay. Yeah. Right. So there was no offering he could give, right? He, sa- he says that plainly. All right. right? So he's going to, um, I'm just looking it up here. My E swords slowly. So he says, Psalm, 51, right? This is the one, you know, created me a clean heart of God, right? That that idea. He says, thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. Um, then he says, do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shall thou be pleased with sacrifices of righteousness and with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. So one of the things he says is that without a converted heart, um, offerings actually mean nothing. They're, they're, they're showing God's mercy that's already given. So, you know, if you're going to use Wagner's argument, you have to go right back to the beginning of the sanctuary uh, symbolism if you're going to apply any of it, right? So he could argue that the sanctuary symbolism means nothing, right? Uh, But he can't do that because he's still going to believe, you know, Jesus died. He's the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Can a lamb take away sins? Right. So to even understand how Christ has taken upon himself our sin, 
we need to understand that these sacrifices symbolize that. But the sacrifices themselves cannot remove sin. And, and that's going to be talked about in the book of Hebrews, right? Um, in Hebrews chapter 9, 9 verse 9. Yeah, I should show you what I'm looking at. So Hebrews 9 verse 9. Well, we start at verse 8. Now, he's going to go through, like, the holy place and the most holy place and talking about them, right? So he talks about the first compartment, the second compartment. In verse 8, he says, the Holy Ghost is signifying uh, that the way into the holiest of all uh, was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. So what is it that needs to be cleansed? What needs to be made perfect? What what could these sacrifices not do? It, it couldn't it couldn't clean it couldn't clean the heart. Right, it can't clean the heart or the conscience, right? They use the yeah. word conscience. Yeah. Change the heart, yeah. Yeah. So so one is we we need to understand that this is not about animal sacrifices, you know, doing having any benefit. The thing is it's it's a figure, it's a type. It was a figure for the time then present where these offerings were sacrificed. But it's understood they they that did the service, it could not make them perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Which it, still, it was all pointed, it was all pointed to Jesus Christ. Right. It's all it's all a figure, right? Yeah. yeah. But Christ being come in high priest, verse eleven, nine eleven, uh, of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle. Not made with hands, with hands, that is to say, not of this creation or building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but once, but by his own blood, he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Right. And that's where he's going to say, you know, where he's going to talk about that heavenly sanctuary needs to be cleansed with better sacrifices. He's going to go on and talk about that. Right. So he's going to show that we have all of these sacrifices, but they're all pointing to something else, right? So in verse 23, it's therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these. And of course, he doesn't have to offer himself often. He only has to offer himself once at the end of the world. And 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 remember, this contradicts what Wagner, like Wagner says, well, Christ, you know, was offered at the foundation of the world. Now, he didn't die at the foundation of the world. Right. He died at a certain point in history. And yet he is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And Christ did not die at the found from the foundation of the world. Like literally, right? He died at a certain point in history, April 27, 31 AD. So the fact that that you know, so Wagner is playing around with taking things that are symbols and trying to make them literal. So when we talk about the investigative judgment, we need to understand it in the context of the sanctuary itself. Because the earthly sanctuary is the type. We have, you know, uh, in the great controversy, Ellen White um, talks about this, this investigative judgment. She's going to use this term here. So she says, in the new covenant... The sins of the repentant are by faith placed upon Christ and transferred, in fact, to the heavenly sanctuary. Now, when we say this, we understand that being transferred, in fact, the sins of the repentant are by faith placed upon Christ. So how do my sins get transferred to Christ? Is it something that literally occurs? Like, you understand what I mean by that? Literally. Like, we're not going to see the sins moving from me to going to Christ, right? We understand that even in this language being placed upon Christ, it's still figurative language. It's the chastisement of our peace. So mm-hmm. it wasn't a literal. Yeah, I so. We the literal chastisement. Yeah, because sins can't yeah. literally just move from one person to another. 
right? We, right. We and that's where the ridicule. That's where the ridicule happens, right? When people, you know, yeah. right? yeah. picture word picture out of that. Yeah. yeah. So, so when it says it's transferred, in fact, to the heavenly sanctuary, mm. you know, the heavenly sanctuary, obviously, God has now taken upon himself the responsibility for sin, right? right. So when Jesus right. dies on the cross, he takes upon himself the responsibility for sin temporarily. Because he's just like mortgage companies and banks, same as mortgage companies and banks could compare, perhaps, like swapping securities and mortgages and oh bernie sanders or what was that guy that yeah anyway uh, yeah yeah right. so yeah so the the idea now see so wagner has argued Probably that the judge of whether it matters or not though <laughs> so he says he says sin is not a thing that it can be transferred right 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 so he says it's a disease this is, this is jones or this wagner? is wagner this is right. wagner's confession of faith right Right. So Wagner's off track here. Um, so he says, you know, we can use the idea that the Bible teaches that it's an illness, right? A disease. Um, but the Bible also teaches it's a debt, right? He argues against the one Deadly illustration. Illness. So one is, a t- illness. Yeah. Yeah. So one is a symbol. This delay here. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Let me finish here. One is, a symbol. one is a symbol. Debt is a symbol. Right, the idea that sin is a debt, that's a symbol. And the mm-hmm. idea that it's an illness is also a symbol. But he chooses mm-hmm. one symbol and says that's what it is, and the other one, that's not what it is. Oh, <clears throat> okay, one's literal, one's symbol. What do you do in the world? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can't do that. Not right. That. <laughs> so all of these symbols are just illustrations of a truth. They are not to be taken literally. Like, even the idea of being born again, we don't take it literally. That's a, no, that's a basic lesson first in the Gospels. Yeah, but but we don't literally, we're not born again literally. Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. That, yeah. that lesson of not being born literally is one of the first lessons that Jesus gives them. Nicodemus, yeah. right? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. so we understand symbols, symbols are symbols. Symbols are not actual. But but there is a way in which we can understand. So as the typical cleansing of the earthly sanctuary was accomplished by the removal of sins by which it had been polluted, so the actual cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary is accomplished by removal or blotting hey, out of on. the things there recorded. Hold on. Yeah. Kindergarten question here for me. Um, so right for the first three words you said, symbols cannot be what what was it cannot be interpreted literally yeah numbers okay say it again well a symbol is not literal like jesus is the lamb of god he doesn't have a wall he's not a lamb he's not a sheep and so you were defining what what a symbol is what a literal is is that where we're going yeah yeah the difference between literal and figurative figurative right Right, a figure is a symbol, right? right. Mm. And and so, mm. it's such a basic idea, but people do this all of the time. Figure they take something that's a symbol and they try to use it literally. How is that example? What's that like? Well, um, figure literally. Uh, taking a, a symbol literally. Well, like for mainstream a, Sunday. You yeah, ask the question. Or? Let me answer the question. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I like answering my own questions. Yeah. So, so E.J. Wagner does this in his book, um, uh, "The Everlasting Gospel." Which is so have a conversation. Gospel. Sorry. So he just in the I book. There wasn't this delay. There's too much delay, Kelly. I know. I'm going to shut up now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Just do short answers. Don't don't talk long because it doesn't work. Okay. So, um, so in the book, uh, The Everlasting Covenant, he takes it literally, um, the idea of, um, I'm trying to remember how he words it, but the idea that, you know, the spirit, the Holy Spirit is the breath or the wind, right? 
So he takes things literally, like the bread. Jesus is the bread that came down from heaven. So every time you eat bread, you are eating the body of Christ. That the whole, that, you know, God is spirit. Well, well, the word spirit is the word breath or wind. So every time you breathe, you're breathing in God. And he's not taking it as a symbol. He's taking it literally. That literally God is in the wind. That God is in the bread. And we understand that wind is a symbol uh, of something that can't be seen but we can feel its effects, right? That's why the word spirit, word spirit is the word wind. Like kind of pantheism, like pantheism. Yeah, that's that's what Wagner came to believe. So what, Wagner's a pantheist. We have to remember at this point. So so he's taking lots of things literally, but not everything literally. Like so, he picks and chooses what he wants to be literal and what he wants to be figurative. And he mixes them all up. And and these types of games, it's impossible to talk to somebody who's playing these types of games. I, I, I run into them all the time. They they won't take something. Well, my dad used to do it. You know, you would sit, you'd start talking and you said, well, the Bible says this. And he says, the Bible doesn't say anything. It can't speak. Right. You know, just to, I, I don't know why he would say that, because he knows what we mean by that, at least he should. You know, it, somebody wrote in the Bible something, you know, obviously I'm not saying that the Bible is is speaking, right? But he's just taking something and taking it over overtly literal to to make an argument. And that's not really an argument. Okay. So anyway, uh, Ellen White says here, the cleansing of the sanctuary, therefore, oh, i got to go back. But before this can be accomplished, there must be an examination of the books of record to determine who, through repentance and faith in Christ, are entitled to the benefits of his atonement. Now, this is probably where people get the idea of what Wagner had said. But you have to look at it in, the, in what she's saying in the context here. So she's just saying that there is a time when the blotting out of sins occurs. That is the removal of sins in heaven. Right. That is, Christ has temporarily taken upon himself the responsibility for sin. And at a certain point, he's going to confess those sins upon the head of the scapegoat, right? Satan. Because Satan is is the one ultimately responsible for sin. Correct? God is not responsible. Now, God, in a sense, is responsible because he created us, and so we sinned. But there is no reasonable reason for Satan to have rebelled against God. So Satan is the instigator of sin. But Christ takes that upon himself temporarily until this work of investigation can be done. At the end of the investigative judgment, the sins are confessed upon the head of the scapegoat, right? So the high priest takes the Lord's goat, that represents the 144,000, right? He takes the Lord's goat, we have the Lord's goat and the scapegoat. The Lord's goat is going to have no sins confessed upon it, and the blood of the Lord's goat is going to be sprinkled to cleanse the sanctuary. And then the priest himself has those sins upon him, and he then confesses them upon the head of the scapegoat. So this is symbolizing what's actually happening. Not It's not literally happening in heaven, right? So Satan, at the close of probation, that's when the sins are going to be uh, confessed upon the head of the scapegoat, right? That's the close of probation. And our sins will be blotted out. Ellen White says that, says that we cannot bring them to remembrance. So the 144,000 during the period from the close of probation to the second coming, have no uh, memory of sins that they have committed. But do they see themselves as righteous, even though they can't remember their actual sins? No, they don't see themselves as righteous. So. No. So, now, Christ, did he have any sins? No. Uh -uh. He's just, he's only tempted, that's it. Yeah. And did he see himself as righteous? No, he just saw his father as righteous. Right, right. 
So, so the 144,000 are exactly like Christ was in humanity. The, Christ had our sinful nature. He had no memory of sins because he never sinned, right? He had no actual sins. The 144,000, they have sinned, but their sins have been blotted out. They have no memory of sins. But yet they still cannot see themselves as righteous. They have a sense of their unworthiness, even though they cannot bring their sins to remembrance, right? So when Ellen White talks about this, this work of investigation, this work, a work of judgment prior to the coming of Christ, that means there is a work that has to be accomplished. And it's typified in the earthly sanctuary itself. Symbol, symbol of salvation. Right. So, so, right. So when we look at this next statement, thus those who follow the light of the prophetic word saw that instead of coming to the earth at the termination of the 2300 days in 1844, Christ entered the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to perform the work, the closing work of atonement preparatory to his coming. Now, so we have to think about this. Okay. Um, and I'm just going to read the next sentence. Just when Christ, by virtue of his blood, removes the sins of his people from the heavenly sanctuary at the close of his ministry, he will place them upon Satan, who must bear the final penalty. The scapegoat was sent away into a land not inhabited, never to come again into the congregation of Israel. So will Satan be forever banished from the presence of God and his people, and he will be blotted from existence in the final destruction of sin and sinners. That's the executive judgment. So when we talk about the investigative judgment, we're just making an analog with the earthly sanctuary, what happens on the Day of Atonement. Now, does it, we don't literally believe that God doesn't know, right? It's just that symbolically we have a work of investigation, right? Because, because those sins that are forgiven, that, that God's people that have gone into the cleansing of the sanctuary, um, that have gone into the, into the sanctuary that need to be, the sanctuary needs to be cleansed from. Those are the sins that, that have to be dealt with, right? So you need this work of investigation. Now, you know, somebody could argue maybe it's not the best word. We could have used some other word, but it is a type of judgment. Judgment usually includes investigation. Right. In a, in a court setting on earth, is there an investigation made as part of judgment? Right. All she's trying to do is distinguish the idea of one kind of judgment from another kind of judgment. One is the, the, the executive judgment. The other we, we call an investigation. It's an examination of a case. One justifies justifies the center. Well, you know, Christ justified a sinner by, by the death upon the cross, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Kelly has a comment here. Um, so this is from Spirit of Prophecy. The Father laid our sins where none but his own eyes could discern them. And as he hid his face from the innocence of Christ, so he will hide his eyes from the guilt of the believing sinner because of the righteousness imputed to him. The righteousness of Christ laid upon us will draw upon us um, the most precious blessings in this life and will bestow upon us everlasting life in the kingdom of God. That's from Signs of the Times, December 8th, 1898. So, so we can see here, God obviously knows all of these things. So this is not for God's benefit. It is just something symbolized in the sanctuary. And that is, in order for... The sins to be placed upon the scapegoat, our sins. So the sins of those that have been forgiven. We have to know that it has to be those that actually have participated in that work. And so this work of investigation is something that we will see later because after, after Christ comes back, we're going to be looking through this, this record of this court case, so to speak. And seeing that the judgment was just, right? The God's investigation was correct because God's going to declare who is righteous and who is unrighteous. He says, let him that is righteous be righteous still. Let him that is filthy be filthy still. 
right? So we know that God is going to close probation and he doesn't do it arbitrarily. That is, he can know not just in the present, but in the past. So the work that Christ is doing is deciding, is deciding for, for the symbol of the sanctuary that he can then close probation because the sins of those that have been the righteous, those are the ones that are going to be put upon the head of Satan, right? The sins of the wicked are not put upon the head of Satan, correct? Right. Yeah. So, so in order to know what sins to put just in a figure, in a type, there has to be an investigation. It's not so that God knows who's going to be saved and who's not going to be saved, but that those that are entitled to the benefits of his atonement has to be determined, right? Now, God knows, of course, the end from the beginning, but he's doing this for our benefit because we're going to be, there's going to be some whose sins are confessed upon the scapegoat and some that aren't. And this is after the sins have already been forgiven by Christ. Satan will now bear the responsibility for the sins that he caused the righteous to commit. Every other, the wicked are going to bear the responsibility for their own sins that they committed. Right. So Satan, he gets a double double whammy, his own sins, plus the sins of all those that are righteous. And that's all it's talking about. This, this isn't well understood in Adventism. You know, no, it's, it's not. It's not, it's not it's oh, not it's usually talking, right? So we have some some sort of sketchy notions about it. But if you ask people about if you and I've done this, talk to Adventists and start asking them questions about the investigative judgment, and they don't really know what it is. They don't know why we have it. They don't understand how it's typified in the sanctuary, and 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 the purpose that it's it's connected to what happens to Satan on the Day of Atonement. And what that means literally in, in reality, in history, that Satan will, um, that's when all of this, this trouble happens upon the, on the world is once probation is closed, we have the, that time of trouble. The 144,000 are preserved in that time, though they're going to experience the agony of the cross, right? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So, so this is important to understand for Seventh-day Adventist, Adventist, for anyone to understand what God is doing, why Jesus hasn't come back yet. Yeah, okay, go on. That's yeah. I, never, I never really fully understood it either. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah, it's not usually talked about much. No, it's not. And, and often misrepresented. Right now, now in Adventism, what they say is God is under trial. You know, he's the one who's being investigated on the Day of Atonement. Yeah, I've heard that quite a bit. Yeah, that's not what the Bible teaches, so. The roots to that is uh, Morris Fenton, really. Yeah, I know. Back all that far. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just Mm -hmm. flies up, but there's some of his stuff that's really well well written. Well, it's all well written, just lots of it's not true. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) <laughs> you know, uh, I a friend of mine, she's not 90-something now, but she was friends with Morris Fenton and counseled him, actually, when he was dying during that time. And that uh, he 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 was, uh, he felt lost. But Margaret helped him out. True righteousness by faith. Okay. True story. It's okay. Okay, in the faith face of this truth, so often repeated, talking about his idea that God knows everything, so we can't have an investigative judgment. Uh, Wagner goes on to say, how can any thoughtful believer of the Bible teach that it is necessary for God to spend years in searching records to find out who are true followers of him and who are not? We are expected to teach as a fundamental article of faith that it was already that it is already taking God, assisted by hosts, hosts of angels, Almost 72 years to go over the records, several times longer, by the way, than it was supposed would be required. And still the work is not done. It brings God down to the level of man. Now, he's bringing God down to the level of man because he's misrepresenting what we believe. But anyway, 
Yeah. Um, but is there not to be a judgment? Most certainly. The scriptures teach when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the angels with him. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory and the dead, small and great of all nations shall stand before him to be judged. But they nowhere say anything about any judgment before Christ's coming. So, yes, this verse says nothing about any judgment before Christ's coming. But the sanctuary itself symbolizes a work of investigation before the sins can be confessed upon the head of the scapegoat. So it's fine to say, well, here in this, obviously, they're not going to say anything about the investigative judgment because they're going to talk about the executive judgment. Okay, the object of judgment is not that God may learn all about men, but men may learn the truth about God. They will not learn it through preaching his word. Uh, so they must see everything for themselves, just as it was in relation to every other thing, so that every knee, even Satan's, shall involuntarily bow and every tongue confess to God, acknowledging that Jesus Christ is Lord. Everyone that is cut off must acknowledge that his punishment is just, and even the righteous who have trusted God and believed in his goodness and justice, without the understanding all, without understanding all things, must have all things set before them so clearly that there will be no possibility for any doubt or question ever to arise. Now, this is why this is important. So he's saying here that there has to come a point where every knee will bow and every tongue confess. Now, do we see the necessity of what's symbolized in the Day of Atonement? So if we think about the Day of Atonement, we have... It first is going to begin with offerings, the bullock, you know, they're going to offer them for the, for the priests, I think goats for the, um, uh, the ruler, the, the king. There's lots of different offerings that are offered. And these are sin offerings where sins are confessed upon them. And then we're going to have two goats presented and they're going to cast lots. Which one's going to be the Lord's goat, and which is going to be the scapegoat. There's no difference between the goats. Right. And often we just say, well, the Lord's goat represents Christ and the scapegoat represents Satan. But the Lord's goat represents the completed work of Christ in his people. That is, the Lord's goat would represent one hundred and forty four thousand. In to some degree. Right now, it's primarily represents Christ, I would say. But. um Without the experience of the 144,000, can the wicked be condemned? Can the righteous be saved? Well, yeah, the wicked could never be condemned without that. Okay, because in order to condemn the wicked, Christ has to demonstrate that the work of salvation is possible. That he can have, because because Christ knows the heart. He knows who who could be in heaven and who couldn't. But we need to know that. We need to see that when God declares someone is righteous, they are righteous and they won't turn from their righteousness. And when God says somebody is wicked, they are wicked and they won't turn from their wickedness. So without understanding the sanctuary service and what's involved here, um, it's easy for, um, you know, it's easy to say, well, God's just going to come and up one day he's just going to show up. He's going to reveal himself and and he's going to choose some as being saved and some as being lost. He's going to do the judgment then. But they have no opportunity to demonstrate. It. So a work of judgment has to occur first to show who is righteous and who is wicked. Right. Not for God's sake, but for our sake, so that when we. So when God declares someone is righteous, we can see that God declared them as righteous and they don't depart from their righteousness. And when God declares someone is wicked, they're wicked and they don't depart from their wickedness. Because many people who are going to be in heaven, God is going to say, this person's going to be in the kingdom. And we're going to say, well, they weren't a very good person. Why are they in the kingdom? Well, because God can judge the heart. And we'll know that because we will have seen it demonstrated. And then we're going to say, well, why isn't this person in heaven? This was a good person. You know, like they said they believed in you and everything. But yet there's going to be many people who say they believe in God and are going to demonstrate that they're wicked. So when God can look at somebody who is 
who we think is good and say, I know the heart, we can trust that God does know the heart because we don't want sin to rise up a second time. And we're going to go over the record books during the thousand years. You know, we're not going to sit there with actual books, right? We understand that there's going to be a work of examination done by the 144,000. And, and to show one is that the judgment was just so that when that's presented to the wicked after the thousand years, they will also acknowledge that that judgment is just. But without that experience of the final generation, you can't have that happen. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? You can't just have God show up one day and say, well, you know, I chose these people to be saved and these people to be lost. And and you just have to trust me. So it like, sounds like a would sound like an arbitrary choice. Right. So, you know, <laughs> so that's what the sanctuary is showing. That's all the sanctuary truth is showing is that God is being thorough for a purpose. You know, so obviously God isn't really literally examining the record books. He already knows the end from the beginning. But in symbol, in type, he is because he's going to have a group of people who he's going to declare as righteous and another group of people that he declares as wicked. And when that happens, you know, the sins of the righteous are going to be placed upon the head of the scapegoat. So Satan is going to, in that period of time, seeking everything he can do to overthrow the righteous and make them turn from their righteousness. And they're going to go through the time of Jacob's trouble where Satan's going to personate Christ and everything in their senses tells them that they're wrong, that the accusations against them are true. But by faith, because they're not trusting in themselves, they trust in God, they leave everything in God's hands. And because of that, they can live in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. They are not going to sin. That is the final generation. And that is looked down upon in Adventism today. They call it last generation theology. But it's what the Bible and spirit of prophecy teach. So <clears throat> we're going to go on here, read a bit more. Uh, the object of the judgment is not that God may learn all about it. But man, we, I think we read that. Okay, Seventh-day Adventist teaching concerning the sanctuary with its investigative judgment to proceed the blotting out of sins is virtually a denial of the atonement. It, it is a denial of the atonement in the way that many Christians understand it, but it's not a denial of the actual atonement. Um, he says, true, much is made of the anti-typical day of atonement uh, beginning in 1844, but that very thing minimizes, if it does not nullify, the value of the blood of Christ in, it, in that it teaches that a man may receive the blood, the life, and not receive the atonement. I'm not sure how it does that, but anyway. Uh, the gospel has been turned into ceremonialism. I'm not sure how it does that. <clears throat> because, I mean, that's the old covenant, right? So so obviously we know that the old covenant points to this. So he says, the eyes of so many have long been fixed upon the shadows that it is almost impossible for them to see the light. So he's saying these shadows or types don't represent any kind of reality. And so we should just ignore them. Now, why did God give us these types? To understand the, what the types point to is not ceremonialism. And, and if, yeah, and, yeah, and so if he's going to apply this to, to the sanctuary service, how is that any different than if we're going to deal with um, uh, just the offering of, of the sacrifice? That's a type. Oh. Is that ceremonialism? Because we say Jesus is the Lamb of God. It takes away the sin of the world. Well, like a picking and choose kind of thing. Right, exactly. So he's picking some parts of the sanctuary, but rejecting other parts of it. He says, I'm not bringing any charge against their lives, only against their teaching, making the word of God of none effect, that they may attain their tradition. Look over the literature from the beginning, and it will be apparent that they have transferred the Jewish sanctuary and its ceremonies into heaven and have made the atonement itself only ceremony. Now, again, we, we can say, now he says Jewish sanctuary. Now, this is sort of polemical language, right? Because Jewish is like a bad word back then, right? In that idea. 
Is that what we're doing is just transferring the Jewish sanctuary and this and its ceremonies into heaven? What's polemica? Polemic polemical argumentative language. They're gonna fight. Well, it's argumentative language. It's 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 not like in using the word Jewish, it it's it's to belittle it, right? Okay. Right. It's baiting for a comment sort of thing. Yeah. He's, okay. he's just he's just yeah, he's just depicting it in a way that's negative language right. to make a point rather than just yeah. being plain and straightforward. So okay. so he says everything must be made to fit the type as though the shadow of the thing were of more importance than the thing itself. And I don't think that's what's happening. But anyway, you do not depend upon photographs to give you the exact information as to your wife's features and characteristics. I dare you say there was a time before your marriage when you paid a good deal of attention to her picture and no doubt have some of those pictures still. But I don't believe that you have spent much time studying them in the last 35 or 40 years. You don't care for her picture as long as you have her. And I'm sure that you don't insist that she can't be your wife if she does not in all respects correspond to those pictures. Why then should we spend time studying shadows when we have the reality? Well, the reason why we study shadows is because types tell you and explain what the reality is. If, if you didn't have types, you would have no way of knowing what is real. Uh, for we have come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling. And the context there is important. So, you know, he's quoting this but ignoring the context. So let's look at the context here. That's one of my scripture songs. Sorry about that. Sometimes I can't find verses when I'm looking for them. Lots of times I can't. Yeah, it's right where I was looking. It's like right there and I didn't see it. Okay. So I'll share the screen here. This is in chapter 12. Just So in chapter 12, verse 18, he says, For ye are not come unto the mount, that might be touched and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest. So this is when the law was given, right? Mount, Mount uh, Sinai. And the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. For they could not endure that which was commanded. And so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of speaking, sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, once more, signifieth, that is, shows in types or symbols, the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, are we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear for our God is a consuming fire. So here we can see that he's using this illustration of Mount Sinai and Mount Zion, one representing the old covenant, the other the new covenant. So we know that there is a contrast between the type and the antitype, that the type cannot fully represent the antitype. It's only a sign, a figure, a symbol. Now, is it possible that there are some Seventh-day Adventists who treat the new covenant as if it's the old covenant? Maybe. I haven't seen it. But but that's the argument he's making. 
He's saying that people are um, just, you know, they, they still have a sanctuary. It's no different than the earthly sanctuary. It's just, you know, it's, it's in heaven. And that, but we know that those types pointed to the work of Christ. So let's go back. We'll finish this off here. So he says the ancient sanctuary and with its ceremonies was essentially type by contrast. Now that is partly true. There is some contrast between the type and the anti-type. But I wouldn't say that it's essentially a type by contrast. There are some things that are con- that, that are contrasted, right? Right, the blood of bulls and goats can't take away sins. But we can't just say that 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 God only gave the ancient sanctuary to contrast it to uh the new covenant. So so he has this idea which uh, that's what know, that's what he thinks, huh? Is that yeah. that's what Daniel yeah. thinks? Yeah, that's what he thinks. It was built because the children of Israel would not have God dwell in them. Uh, but for their unbelief they might have come direct to the sanctuary which God's had established and might have talked with God face to face as Moses did. So do we believe that the only reason the earthly sanctuary was built was because of unbelief? When when Solomon sets up the his temple, he understood that when they prayed towards the temple that God heard in heaven. Right? He understood the typical nature of the temple. I, I just find this extremely hard to take, this idea that that the sanctuary uh was only built because of unbelief to contrast. That is, he says that the earthly sanctuary was basically just to show that they had unbelief. More than that. So, yeah, so it's definitely more than that. So the coming, the coming yeah. Messiah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The promise, I mean, if we read Hebrews, we obviously know that Christ is our high priest. He's the true high priest. But we know that 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 the high priest in the earthly sanctuary was a type. Right. A type is not a contrast. I mean, there are things that are contrasted, but you can't say that. The promise was if they kept God's covenant as Abraham did, they should be kingdom of priests. Instead, the priesthood was confined to one tribe and to one family of that tribe and was utterly useless so far as freeing from sin was concerned. Instead of having the law of the spirit of life, the living stone from which they could drink righteousness, they have the law of lifeless stone, the ministration of death. Now, so he's saying that, you know, basically God shouldn't really have done any of this if we're going to take Wagner's idea, right? Because he, he's putting a stumbling block. Instead, God is trying to illustrate something to them. Uh, the tabernacle of witness was a continual witness against them. Of course, they were not shut up to those weak and unprofitable things for whoever turned to the Lord in truth had the veil taken away and could, like Moses, behold the glory of God. What I wish to emphasize is that we are not to spend precious time studying the minutest details of a system that was only the product of unbelief, which it's not a product of unbelief, it was built by God. When with Abraham and Isaiah and Paul, we may by faith have boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. The writer of the epistle to the Hebrews, in referring to the tabernacle and his instrument said, of which we cannot speak particularly, and it seems to me that we would do well to follow his example. Well, that is a really bad argument. So all that Paul is saying, we cannot now speak particularly of these things because I don't have enough time to write about them. But Paul is not saying we should not never speak about them particularly. I mean, it's it's just, it, it's pretty bizarre when you think about it, of of what we can do in avoiding the truth. Just, uh, it just sounds too deliberate. Yeah. And it's hard. Yeah. And, and the thing is, we can do these things. We, we can, we can start down a path and we can find all kinds of arguments for why we're doing what we're doing. But yet they're not really good arguments. We have to misrepresent the truth. Um, he says, let me note by way of inconsistency on the part of who insists that everything must fit the type. In the type, the atonement day was just one day out of 360 days, the last day of the year. Of course, we know there wasn't 360 days in here. According to SDA teaching, Christ was in the first apartment of the heavenly sanctuary from his ascension 
till 1844, or 810 years, which time correspond to the yearly service in the tabernacle, leading up to the Day of Atonement. 810 years corresponds to the 359 in the type. The 359 days is as is to one day as 810 years, is to five years and 15 days. Therefore, if the type were to be followed exactly, the antitypical Day of Atonement ought to have ended sometime in 1849. Why insist on following the type so closely in other respects and ignore it in the important matter of time? Now, Stephen Jameson in 2018, he followed this, right? So remember what Stephen did? He he looked at the date um, uh, when Christ um, uh, began his work in the holy place that was um, Pentecost. And he's going to count the number of days from Pentecost to October 22nd, 1844. And he's going to find that it, um, I'm trying to remember the numbers here. I think I can find them. So it's kind of interesting because, because Wagner, I exactly remember that. Yeah. So, um, the number of days, let me see. I, I'm just going to find it here. So, so he is kind of right. Doing the same thing Stephen did. So this is, two, I'm just looking through my emails here. So 2018. Okay. <clears throat> so what, what Stephen Jameson did is he, he added, uh, okay. So if he counted, um, so he took 349 days. I'm just trying to uh, rewrite this. So 359 days in prophetic time. And he took out one of those. And so he multiplied uh, 359 times, I think what he did, about 1844 is what he did. And he got 661,996. And that's going to be 300. And if we look at the actual number of time between those. So sorry about this. So in 31 AD, uh, it's going to be in June. It's going to be. Uh, June 17th on the Julian calendar. It's going to be the sixth day of the third month. That's Pentecost. And then you count the number of days to 1844, October 22. And the number of days ends up being 662,314. So, so it's going to be, uh, more days. So, Minus six, six, two, three, one, four. And the number of days is 318 days different. Uh, I'm not going to go into this right now. It's too, too complicated, but it ends up showing the time when Jesus is crucified. But it, it's, it's really fascinating. I'm, I'm, I just don't have time to do it. It's going to take me too long. I'm, I'm too tired. I'll, I'll do this another time. Maybe I'll show this next week. So I'll go through and show what Stephen did with this. So this is very similar to what Stephen did, but he's going to use it as as a mocking, but it's actually going to be something that points to the cross. Right? So so we know there's so many things that show the 2300 days and Millerite history connected to 457, all of these things that we've studied. So I'll show that next week. I'll go through and I'll show the diagram that he did. And everything and why this is important. But Wagner has it right under his nose here. And he's going to use it to mock it. Say, well, you know, the Day of Atonement should have ended in 1849. And I actually agree it should have. So, you know, God has extended the time. Why? Why? I think that's the first I've heard that idea. What, that God has extended the time? No, no that the Day of Atonement should have ended in 1849. Okay, well, I'll show that next week. We'll go through the study Good. next week. Look forward to it. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let's let's close with prayer. Uh, dear Father in heaven, thank you for the Sabbath, for the fellowship. We pray for the studies tomorrow. And we ask, Lord, that um, we can examine our hearts to that you can weed out any unbelief that we may have, especially unbelief that comes from hurt feelings and 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 bitterness and selfishness the things and, and pride, uh, the, the things that are so hard to see in ourselves. And we pray for one another. 
we know, Lord, that you have a purpose and a plan. Help us to uh, submit to your will, especially when it goes against ours. Thank you again for the Sabbath. May it truly be a blessing to each one. May your angels watch over our families and one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.